Welcome to episode 9 of the Monday Night Review. I just call it the Friday Night Review, but it is, in fact, the Monday Night Review. It's the last week of the academic year for my kids, so I'm expecting chaos to take over for the next six weeks or so. Also, I'd like to dedicate today's episode to my seafaring husband. I overheard him discussing reincarnation with our eight-year-old son the other day, and uh, my son asked if his dad was reincarnated, and Joe responded by saying, I was definitely a sailor, absolutely, no doubt. So Captain Joe, who's been keeping us afloat since I broke my wrist, and who longs to go on a boat but lives with a load of landlubbers, this one's for you. I'd also like to apologise in advance for any Scottish listeners. I'm about to murder every name in this a story, so I, I'm so sorry. So today we're going to talk about the strange disappearance at the Flannan Isles Lighthouse. Near the highest point on Isle Moor, which is one of the Flannan Isles in the Outer Hebrides off the west coast of Scotland, stands a lighthouse. The Flannan Isles were named after St Flannan, a 6th century Irish bishop who later became a saint. He built a chapel on the island and his congregation grew, but they didn't stay on the island for long. It was believed the island had supernatural powers and was home to fairies, and these fairies were the reason that St. Flannan and his congregation left the island. For centuries, shepherds used to bring over sheep to the island to graze, but they'd never stay the night, fearful of the spirits believed to haunt the remote spot. One of the only man-made features on the island is the 23-metre, 75-foot, lighthouse which was designed by David Allen Stevenson for the Northern Lighthouse Board. Construction started in 1895 and was completed in 1899. So the construction of the lighthouse and I would say if you can go and check out our Facebook page and our Instagram page both of them are at the Monday Night Review for pictures because it really helps this story if you can see just the the layout of this island and how remote it is and the two landing stages and the railway. So the construction of the lighthouse included railway tracks for the transport of provisions for the keepers and fuel for the light. The light consumed 20 barrels of paraffin a year up the street gradients from the landing places by means of a cabled hauled railway powered by a small steam engine in a shed adjoining the lighthouse. A track descended from the lighthouse in a westerly direction and then curved round to the south. In 1925, the lighthouse was one of the first Scottish lights to receive communications from the shore by wireless telegraphy. I find it really hard to say that word. Perhaps due to its extreme location. And in the 1960s, the island's transport system was modernised. The railway was removed, but they took up the the metal that they left behind the concrete bed on which it had been laid to serve as a roadway for a NAT, a three-wheeled, rubber-tired cross-country vehicle, which in turn was retired not long after when a helipad was constructed. And on the 28th of September 1971, the lighthouse was automated. So our story is taking place in 1900, and life in a lighthouse was not fun, especially during the 19th century and earlier. No electricity. Certainly no plumbing, living with your colleagues 24-7 for weeks on end, with your shift starting from sunset to sunrise. For the NLB lightkeepers, it was officially starting at 4pm. During storms, you would just have to sit it out. You were on shift for the length of the storm. Keeping the light going was just one part of the job. You had to keep the glass, the lens clean. The mechanism had to be kept working. You had to make sure that... The cranes and ropes and everything for when the provisions were delivered were safely stored and ready to receive any new provisions. Uniform had to be clean, pressed, worn correctly all the time. Failure to be dressed properly or any loss or damage of equipment resulted in hefty fines and even termination of your job. Most lighthouses had an attached duplex for two families to live in, but on Island Moor the men's family stayed on the mainland, so the men were there by themselves. There was three men manning the lighthouse, one on shift, two off shift, and a fourth on shore that would rotate on. If you wanted books or papers, you'd order them from a catalogue, and your food and medical supplies and anything you ordered from the catalogue would be delivered on boats. The Eileen Moore lighthouse was called the Kennel. It was a cramped, unpopular posting. It was hard to reach with harsh weather conditions. So... 
Our story starts on the 15th of December 1900, where the steamer Arctor was on its way to Leith from Philadelphia, and it noted in its log that the light from the Eileen Moore lighthouse wasn't working, and the weather conditions were poor. When the ship docked in Leith on the 18th of December 1900, the sighting was passed to the Northern Lighthouse Board, who ordered a relief vessel to be sent out earlier than scheduled. The relief vessel, which is the lighthouse turns Hesperus, was unable to sail from Lewis as planned on the 20th of December due to bad weather, so it didn't reach the island until noon on the 26th of December. The lighthouse was manned by three men, James Decat, Thomas Marshall, who was the man in charge, and Donald MacArthur, with a rotating fourth man spending time on the shore. On arrival, the crew and relief keeper found that the flag staff had no flag, None of the usual provision boxes had been left on the landing stage for restocking, and more ominously, none of the lighthouse keepers were there to welcome them ashore. Jim Harvey, the captain of Hes- Hesperus, attempted to reach them by blowing the ship's whistle and firing a flare, but there was just no response. A boat was launched with Joseph Moore, the relief keeper, uh, and he went ashore alone. As he ascended the steps of the lighthouse, he would later report he had a terrible sense of dread and foreboding. He had forgotten his talisman, and he would later say that this cursed the rest of his life. His family were constantly suffering with premature deaths of family members. Moore found the entrance gate to the compound and the main door both closed and unlocked. Some stories say that the front door is open, but when he went in, the beds were made, there was a half-eaten evening meal on the table, an overturned chair, the clock had stopped. Returning to the landing stage with the grim news, he then went back to the lighthouse with the Hesperus second mate and the seaman, and a further search revealed that the lamps had been cleaned and refilled, and two of the three sets of oil skins were missing, leaving one hanging on the peg, suggesting that one of the keepers had left the lighthouse with no coat in December, during a storm, there wasn't a sign of anyone. So Moore and three volunteer seamen were left on the island to attend to the light, and the Hesperus returned to Lewis. Captain Harvey sent a telegram to the Northern Lighthouse Board dated the 26th of December 1900, saying, A dreadful accident has happened at the Flannans. The three keepers, Decat, Marshall, and, Oca- and the occasional, which is MacArthur, have disappeared from the island. The clocks were stopped and other signs indicated that the accident must have happened about a week ago. Poor fellows. They must have been blown over the cliffs or drowned trying to secure a crane. On Island Moor, the men secured every corner of the island for clues as to the fate of the keepers. They found that everything was intact at the east landing, but there was a lot of damage to the west landing. So, so boats normally landed at the east landing. The west landing had a crane, so that was where, if you just needed to crane things off a boat, that's where they they would go to. A box that was 33 metres, 108 feet, above sea level had broken and its contents were strewn about. Iron railings were bent over. The iron railway by the path was wrenched out of its concrete. A rock weighing more than a tonne had been displaced. And on the top of the cliff at about 200 feet, 60 metres above sea level, turf had been ripped away as far as 33 feet from the cliff edge. On the 29th of December, 1900, Robert Muirhead, a Northern Lighthouse Board superintendent, arrived to conduct the official investigation into the incident. He'd originally recruited all three of the missing men and knew them personally. He examined the clothing left behind in the lighthouse and concluded that Decat and Marshall had gone to the western landing stage and that MacArthur, the occasional, had left the lighthouse during heavy rain in his shirt sleeves. He noted that whoever left the light last and unattended was in breach of the NLB rules and he also noted that some of the damage to the west landing was difficult to believe unless actually seen ropes strewn all over the rocks and no sign of the brown crate which was usually held 70 feet above the platform on a supply crane maybe the crate had been dislodged and knocked down the lighthouse keepers were attempting to retrieve them when an unexpected wave came and washed them out to sea this is the first and most likely theory at the time and muir had included it in his official report to the northern lighthouse board he said, from evidence which I was able to procure, I was satisfied that the men had been, had been on duty up until dinner time on Saturday the 15th of December, that they had gone down to secure a box in which the mooring ropes, landing ropes, etc. were kept, and which was secured uh, in a crevice in the rock, about 110 foot, 34 metres, above sea level, and that an extra large sea had rushed up the face of the rock, 
gone above them and coming down with immense force had swept them completely away. This is the explanation that was given to the, the families of the lost keepers. Ducat left a wife and four children, MacArthur a wife and two children. The NLB were not fully convinced by this. Why were no bodies washed up? Why were two very experienced lighthouse keepers taken by surprise by a rogue wave? Why would anyone go out in a storm in December in the Outer Hebrides in shirt sleeves? Also, the sea at the time should have been calm. The nearest town on the mainland uh, would have an obscured view of the Isles and the lighthouse during bad weather, and that wasn't the case on the 15th. The storm didn't start until the night of the 17th, um, by which time the keepers had already disappeared. The, we- the, the weather report from the Arctor boat said that the weather was poor on the 15th as it went past but but not a bad storm. Experienced keepers has said all outside tasks when lighthouse keeping are carried out in the morning, especially things like securing ropes on cliff edges. There's never been an instance of keepers being washed away or lost at sea before, and I don't think there has been since. No bodies were ever found, but there have been mysterious sightings resulting in speculation in newspapers and periodicals at the time, and loads of implausible st- stories ensued such as a sea serpent or giant seabird carrying the men away um the three men arranging for a ship to take them away and start new lives uh abduction by foreign spies or a boat filled with ghosts coming to claim the men more than 10 years later these events were still being commented on in local papers over time a story has developed of the existence of unusual logbook entries They supposedly have martial writing saying on the 12th of December that there were severe winds the likes of which I have never seen before in 20 years. He's also said to have reported that Ducat, who's the most experienced man in the island and the man in charge, was very quiet and Donald MacArthur had been crying. MacArthur was a veteran mariner with a reputation for a violent temper and brawling, so it would be really strange for him to be crying in response to a storm. Log entries on the 13th of December were said to have stated that the storm was still raging. All three men had been praying. These three men were experienced lighthouse keepers who knew they were in a newly built, secure structure 150 feet above sea level. They knew they were safe inside. It seems just so strange for them to be this freaked out by a storm. They'd been together on the island since October, so it's no doubt they've endured plenty of storms together and furthermore there'd been no reported storms in the area on the 12th 13th and 14th of december the final log log entry is said to have been made on the 15th of december stating storm ended sea calm god is over all an investigation by mike dash for the 14 times revealed that the log books were fictional and later additions to the story it's amazing when you're researching this, though, that, that lots of people writing about it include these logbook entries as fact, as a sort of sinister fact, because we know that the, the weather at the time wasn't bad. It was, maybe wasn't great, but it wasn't a terrible storm. So it implies something sinister, but then it's, it has apparently been proved to be fictional. So that's slightly unusual. Subsequent researchers have considered the geography of the island to play the most vital role, which I, I agree with. The coastline of Isle Moor is deeply indented with narrow gullies. The West Landing, which is, is situated in a gully and it terminates in a cave, and in high seasonal storms, water will rush into the cave and then explode out again with considerable force. And so it's possible that Ducat and Marshall had gone to secure equipment in the storm. MacArthur may have seen a series of large waves approaching the island and knowing the likely danger to his colleagues ran down to warn them only to be washed away as well by the violent swell. Some also believe that there could have been a wind vortex, a specific weather condition that can be really extreme in some lighthouse locations due to their high exposed uh, situation and the shape of the buildings. If the two men, not technically on duty, so Decat and Marshall had gone out to the courtyard to secure something. A wind vortex could have carried the first two over the wall of the courtyard and then over the cliff a few meters away. Uh, when MacArthur ran out to check, it was only a matter of 12 to 15 steps to see where they were, hence the lack of coat. He too would have been whipped over the edge by the wind. Though this may seem as far fetched, uh, former 
NLB lightkeeper Alistair Henderson, who weighed about 16 stone, 102 kilos, was carrying a fridge between a lighthouse and the station buildings at another Scottish lighthouse when the wind lifted him, still holding the fridge, off his feet and blew him over and landed. he landed several feet away. So it could happen. James Love, a naturalist and historian who's fascinated by lighthouses, discovered that Marshall was previously fined five shillings when his equipment was washed away during a huge gale. It's likely that in seeking to avoid another fine that he and Decat tried to secure the equipment during the storm and were swept away as a result. The fate of MacArthur, although required to stay behind to man the lighthouse, can be guessed to be the same. Love speculates that MacArthur probably tried to warn or help his colleagues and was swept away too. It would also explain why MacArthur would leave the lighthouse unattended, which was strictly against rules and would result in, in absolute firing. It... it this was a life or death situation, so it would explain it. But Love holds that this theory also has the advantages of explaining the set of oil skins remaining indoors and MacArthur's oat, uh, coat remaining on its peg. But I disagree. I think in December, in a storm in Scotland, let alone the northernest part of Scotland, you would grab your oil skins, even if you were putting them on whilst you were shouting and running, you'd just be unable to do much in that weather without waterproofs another theory is based on the first-hand experience of walter walter albert a keeper at the flannans from 1953 to 1957 he believed one man may have been washed into the sea but then his companions who were trying to rescue him were washed away by more freak waves so there's two more ideas um based on the psychology of the keepers so allegedly macarthur was a volatile character so they think that this may have led to a fight breaking out near a cliff's edge by the West Landing and that caused all three men to fall to their deaths. He's not even supposed to be there. He was covering for another man who was unwell. And as weeks turned into months, it, his patients were wearing thin. We know that he had been writing to Muirhead to try and get removed from the lighthouse he'd been there since october as an occasional he had his own farm to tend at home so he was keen to get off the island so whether his temper frayed and that was it another thing is one that, uh, is that one of the men went insane murdered the other two and threw their bodies into the sea and they and then jumped to his own death this seems unlikely until you consider that uh, island, the island moor station used a bath of mercury to float the lens ap apparatus in. Being exposed to mercury can have different effects on people and some can be really badly affected by it while others don't notice it at all. And actually the expression mad as a hatter comes from milliners who went mad from working with mercury in the course of their hat making. So though the James Love explanation is probably correct, I quite fancy the wind vortex theory. I just don't think you'd go out at night halfway through dinner to secure ropes during a storm why would you suddenly stand up halfway through your meal and be like right now we're going to go and secure the ropes especially if you're so experienced you'd probably have some inkling that the weather was going to get worse you'd have done it in the morning why would you do it at night whereas if a door or something was banging in the courtyard then maybe you would just run out to secure it and get whipped away by the wind and it would explain why MacArthur didn't have his oil skin on if he thought he was just nipping out to see what was happening to his mates. I also just think it's weird that the ropes and things were still on the rocks below if they'd been washed over and the crate had disappeared. How are the ropes still on the lower rocks? Lighthouse keepers living in Eileen Moor have ever since reported feeling really uneasy and hearing voices during their stay. William Ross, who would have been, who who should have been present when the men disappeared, but had his place taken by Donald MacArthur because Ross or a member of his family were unwell. A year and four months to the day after the tragedy, he dropped dead in the light room at the Eileen Glass Lighthouse, which was a sister lighthouse to Eileen Moore. So it's an incredibly tragic story. I there's so many questions you could go into this for hours. I mean. It's, it, it, that people seem fairly sure that the body should have washed up, which kind of, even if it was a murder, the body should have appeared somewhere. But they haven't, but obviously the sea is vast. So I don't know, to me, it, bodies can be lost at sea. Um, and that's the story of the 
the Eileen Moore Flannan Isles Lighthouse Keeper Disappearance. I hope you enjoyed it. I love that kind of story. It, it was a joy to research. As always, send your favourite story, paranormal story, history, geekiness, true crime to the email address that's in the show notes come and track us down on patreon we've got extra content and stuff going on there and until next time be kind stay safe and always check the back seat before you drive